very pleased to be here among you. We are, you know, I'm uh, being serving water and everything so, so that we can warm up to, to the discussion. Uh, my name is Anissa Bellal. I'm the executive director of the Geneva Peace Building Platform. It's, it's really a pleasure um, to be um, here among you and discussing these fascinating issues uh, today. Um, <coughs> we will go um, in order of presentation and uh, the panelists will either choose to, to sit here or um, in, the, in the podium. Um, I will not give a thorough introduction of each um, of the panelists since they have a very rich uh, biography. You have access to their bio in, uh, in the program here. Um, our first <coughs> panelist is Dr. Herika Harper, who is a practitioner and academic, uh, head of research at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. And I think, Erika, you are going to talk over and brush uh, the legal regime applicable to private and military companies. Good morning, thank you. Um, not quite right. I'm going to give kind of a background overview introduction to, to this um, idea, but happy to let, answer questions on, on legal frameworks, uh, of course. Um, thanks to ICOGA and for the support uh, of the various donors. Is it? Everyone can hear me, right? Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to try and navigate the microphone and and my computer at the same time, but if it doesn't work, I'm going to go up to the podium. Um, okay, so I've been um, um, working on the topic of militant PMSCs or, or PMCs for the last couple of years. Um, and over this period, I, I get from time to time, the only best way I can describe it is this foreboding sense of deja vu. And it was only in the last couple of days that I was preparing remarks for this panel that I realised that what it was reminding me of was how just a few short years ago the world was so completely unprepared for a viral pandemic. And if you look kind of back over the scholarship, we can see that um, scientists were kind of raising alerts and warning signs for, for quite some time. They were tracking this, you know, an increase in um, pathogen jumps from animals to humans and they were they were calling out um, deficits so they were calling for um, better early warning systems they were calling out lack of communication with China they were drawing attention to inadequacies in lo local healthcare systems in the global south and yet because this risk you know however high it remained theoretical um, because we couldn't attach you know substantive data to you know when where how bad we didn't prepare. So when the inevitable hit, millions of people died and millions more were thrust into poverty. Now, with PMCs, we've again had these hints and these warning signs. I think a lot of us in the sector kind of thought when the Wagner Group tried to take over the Russian military that maybe this would have pushed the issue at the front of um, people's minds and got a little bit more of attention, um, and it hasn't. Now, part of this is because we have a lot of lack of data around PMCs. Um, they're by design invisible. And this makes it hard to raise a strong case around the potency of the threat. And the result has been a lot of inaction. We are reactionists and we focus on kind of threats here and now that we can see. If we carry on down this road, there's a chance we're going to hit another kind of COVID moment. We're going to turn around and face a completely different peace and security architecture. You know, one that's completely unrecognisable, um, that has a life of its own, and the, the threats are going to be so different that they can't be contained conventionally. So, what to do? Um, it, look, it's correct that we don't have a lot of comprehensive, systematic data on, on what we're looking at. But we do know some stuff and we can use that to fill in gaps. Um, so particularly the forces which are pushing the evolution of PMCs, who benefits from them, this can tell us a bit about what is likely to happen next. So I'm going to talk through a short history on PMCs, um, particularly the forces driving their evolution, and then I'll go back to what we can kind of logically extrapolate from that. So PMC, PMCs, as you know, have been around for a pretty long time. The first big jump that we see is at the end of the Cold War. 
and there's this huge downsizing of military capacity. So countries no longer need these really huge standing armies and they don't need them in former Cold War battleground states, so in Africa and Eastern Europe. So we see this, um, we've got a lot of unemployed men, not so many women, but men with military experience and expertise. We also have a lot of military hardware hitting the market. You can, you can just buy things that you couldn't buy before um, and it's really cheap. And then the third thing is that we enter this era of Thatcherism economic policy. And this is all about downsizing government functions and outsourcing it to the private sector that can deliver public services more efficiently. So we've got these three forces. We've got a lot of um, men looking for jobs. They've got access to guns and other nasty toys. And we've got this narrative that justifies the logic. It, it makes PMSCs make sense. Um, any economist will tell you that we, we've got this excess supply, buyers, you know, suddenly materialise. And certainly the next um, big shift that we see is this rise in demand. So first there's a bunch of states. Um, remember these former battleground states in Africa and Eastern Europe. They suddenly, I mean, when they lost this um, high level military backing, they became extremely fragile and conflict prone. So the leaders of these states, um, you know, PMSCs, PMCs is a really good option. Um, raising a national army, it's, it's risky, it's high cost, and it takes a lot of time. So it makes sense for them. Um, the West also decides that it's not really particularly interested in becoming involved in these intrastate conflicts. Um, during the Cold War, they mattered for their own foreign policy interests. Post-Cold War, not so much. So it scales down how it responds to these crises. It, it becomes a lot more lightweight. And outsourcing really works. You know, you can get in, you can get out. We can lower domestic military casualty rates. And, and this is really critical. They, they work out that for these bespoke kind of operations, local knowledge is really key. And PMSCs, they specialise. They can specialise in a certain region or country or terrain or group. So they're much more effective, even when you compare it to a domestic military intervention. Final consumer, we've got multilateral companies operating in these fragile states. And they've got plant, they've got extractive industries, and they need protection. So PMSCs serve them well, um, too. So we're now at this point where we've got this established market. We've got contractors and principals and supply and demand. Um, but there's a new twist. So contracting states work out that PMCs, they're really pretty good and they can provide something, they can provide options that were never before kind of militarily conceived. And these options kind of start at bad and they go through to completely malign. So States can fight in wars, but they can mask the number of military casualties, and this means they can get more aggressive, but without risking public or political backlash. They can undertake operations that usually would be considered too risky or controversial or complicated. They can use them to do things that violate international law. Um, think back to the role of PMCs in the extraordinary rendition programs in the early 2000s. And states can use PMCs to skirt around rules, okay? So we look mid-1990s, the US contracts a US PMC, it's called MIPRI. Um, well, it, it, it advises Croatia to contract this uh, US PMC called MIPRI. Um, now, it got the end that it wanted, um, which was to push back on, on Serbia during the Balkans War. Um, but because it didn't do it, it didn't have to go through Congress. It could avoid that headache. And it could also get around um, what was at the time the UN embargo on putting military aid into warring Balkan states. This is not small stuff. Like a lot of conflict scholars, they, you know, they see MIPRI as a decisive factor in the levelling of power relations during that period and setting in place some of the, the factors that kind of manifested in the Dayton peace agreements. So, okay, so this is a happy scenario, but I think we've got to realise that, you know, we're getting to a place when PMCs are becoming decisive factors in the outcomes of wars. And they got there because states are working out how to get around the rule framework that we've set in place as an international community. 
Okay, <clears throat> that's the brief history. Um, what can this tell us about what comes next? I think the biggest hint is looking at who PMSCs serve, who do they benefit? And as you can see, it's just, it's just about everyone. So small, low income states, multinational companies, rich states with altruistic interests, rich states with malign interests, everyone. And what this tells us is that unless or until there's an intervening factor, um, they're gonna to continue to get stronger. Um, we've also got a bit of insight into what a PMC COVID moment might look like. Um, I'll end with just four key points on what this future might look like. So number one, PMCs are changing the rules of the game. What states are prepared to do to each other has always been constrained by rules and norms and perceptions of what's legitimate. We call these the entry barriers to conflict. And we want these to be high. We don't want it to be too easy for states to invade or interrupt the stability of another state. PMCs have lowered these entry barriers. So it's moved the needle of engagement from what we can legally and should do to what we can do when no one's watching. Second, PMCs are increasing the intensity and the frequency of conflict. A few reasons why. Um, when one party achieves a win because they cheated, they'll be encouraged to win again under those same rules, so demand increases. Likewise, if one party gets an advantage by employing a, a PMC, the other side is gonna wanna gain that advantage too, to level the playing field. So again, demand increases. Another factor is what's known as commoditization of conflict. Now, because PMCs profit from conflict, more conflict, longer conflict, more intense conflict, it's not in their interest necessarily to pers um, pursue peace. Usually in market rules, they prevent a supplier from exploiting um, consumers in this manner. You can think, think of doctors kind of malprescribing me medicine to get the patient to come back. Now, this doesn't really happen because, well, it's against the law, um, but we also have sufficient supply to encourage competition and therefore compliance. But where PMC is operating, it's kind of a bit of a rule-free framework. So these market mechanisms, these market safeguards, they don't work as well. Third, we can see a compromising of democratic norms. So social contract, the state has a monopoly on the use of force but it's got to use this legitimately and legally um, for the benefit of the public. PMC is taking even a small amount of that monopoly, that, that power to use force, it's weakening the social contract. And we can see this in things like states engaging militarily, it, well, engaging PMCs to engage militarily, um, skirting around parliamentary rules or to lower the, um, you know, the theoretical um, domestic casualty rate, so, so to mislead the pu public. Last thing, it's weakening multilateralism. So part of the attractiveness of PMCs is that they can break rules that states can't or shouldn't. Now, a rule-free zone that's out of reach of international accountability, it, it's compromising the current system's ability to maintain peace and security. Um, if we leave it too long, the risk is that this kind of pervades into a new normal around what states are willing and prepared to do to each other. And I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'll just say that, you know, we've also got to look at this against the backdrop of current multilateralism. There's a lot of polarization, it's very frail. So a new normal, a new negative normal at this particular time when we don't have the strength to put it back together or reinstate uh, safeguards is, it is a risk that we probably, yeah, don't want to pursue. I think I've gone over my 10 minutes, so I'm going to end there. Um, but yes, thank you and happy to answer any questions, of course. Thank you very much, Erica. So thank you very much, Erica, for having uh, brushed this uh, general picture and given us the, um, the tools to navigate, indeed, uh, this, uh, this question of PMCs generally. And now we are going to focus a bit more on, on these uh, private companies that we heard so much about uh, uh, in the last, um, um, let's say, decade, I would say. Um, David Claw, you, you lead the team uh, within the UK's government um, to 
address the cross-cutting um, challenge that has been posed by uh, the Wagner Group. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, this challenge? And indeed, um, the, 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 our panel here um, talks about the Wagner effect. So what is this Wagner effect? Um, yes, so uh, thank you for the introduction and that was a, a really interesting uh, a first uh, uh, speech, I suppose. Um, so I think what I will first say is that it will be useful to explore the problem that, that Wagner po poses by talking about where it operates, giving a brief summation of what it is, where it's been and what we think it's turning into and then touching on at the end how that may enable us to set the context for the rest of this discussion about what can we do, uh, partly as a, from a governmental position about to constrain and, and, and counter Wagner, but also from an industry perspective in ensuring that good actors and bad actors are clearly divided uh, and whether the international scene can help with that. Um, so quickly on, on the team that I run, uh, as I've said, that we are here to help constrain and counter Wagner. And we do that uh, by uh, coordinating UK government policy and action uh, against Wagner Group uh, and other proxy PMSCs, particularly with an interest in, in Russian PMSCs for my patch. Um, but the UK government does consider and monitors other, other actors in this space as well. Um, and I think the word proxy from I'm using to define a sort of malignant effect here and to be very clear, the UK supports a vibrant uh, PMSC uh, community and we understand the, the vital role they pay in ensuring governments, NGOs, companies can operate in complex environments and so there is definitely a balance between what you were talking about, about a spread and, and, and the the risks that are posed by such a spread, um, as well as the need for us to use these organizations such as yourselves to enable us to do the work that we need to do. Uh, um, and so the way that the uh, UK government is uh, beginning this work, or well, continuing this work, I should say, um, first we're calling out what Wagner Group are doing uh, about the malign and destabilizing effect that they've had wherever they operate around the world. Second, we're supporting uh, countries that are at risk of, of uh, potentially employing Wagner or others like them and trying to increase stability, reduce conflict, uh, and doing that in accordance with international obligations and being fully accountable and tailoring that to the needs of the country in a non-exploitative way, which again is a distinction I would put between what we're looking to do and the international community is doing and groups like Wagner. And then thirdly, uh, engaging in forums like this is really vital um, in closing down the uh, grey space and the ambiguity uh, that has prevented uh, accountability of organisations such as Wagner Group. So uh, thank you for, for hosting this event and for inviting the UK to take part in it as well. Uh, as I've said, uh, the need to, to deal with proxy PMSCs I think is becoming clearer uh, as world events uh, move forward, particularly looking at places like Ukraine uh, and, and the roles that, that, that companies have had there, as well as the destabilizing uh, effects in, across Africa and uh, in the Middle East, in, in Syria and Libya, uh, with reference to Wagner Group. Uh, and what we're looking to do is try and isolate and raise the cost on the states that, that choose to use private military companies as proxies in, in that manner. So a quick uh, potted history of, of Wagner Group, and I'm sure uh, others on this panel are, are probably more informed than, than I am on, on, on the history of this, so I welcome extra detail wherever relevant. But um, I should note first that Wagner Group is now a prescribed terror organization in the UK, so I'm using PMSCs because they can be both in our mind, uh, but it is vital to point that out, and they've been prescribed since September. Uh, we believe they were founded uh, around 2014 uh, and has since been operational in a range of theatres, including uh, Central African Republic, Libya and Mali. There have been failed deployments into Mozambique um, and beyond Africa, as I said, in Syria, uh, but also in Belarus and very notably in Ukraine. Uh, it's also worth noting with Wagner in a way that it's slightly distinct from perhaps uh, more historical uh, PMSCs that have acted in a malign way in that they are part of a wider network that uh, the former, uh, the uh, late, I should say, Yevgeny Prigozhin operated. 
Um, that network had media manipulation, political interference, and uh, uh, natural resource extraction as a way of facilitating uh, Wagner's aims and the wider Progosian group aims, uh, and in ensuring that they were able to move nimbly uh, and somewhat autonomously from, from the state, uh, though we uh, would assert that they have very much definitely been a proxy and have helped achieve Russia's foreign policy objectives in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, I might just grab a, a sip of water. Thank you. Mm. Pardon me. Uh, so um, I think it's uh, worth noting as well that that wider Prigozhin network has utilized illicit financial flows uh, and logistics movements to enable Wagner to operate as effectively or, or as supposedly as effectively as they have, um, both spinning uh, what is uh, often an ineffective security offer into something more successful, but also avoiding sanctions that have been placed on them by the UK and the US and uh, the EU uh, in order to continue this activity. Um, and so when we look at combating them in a tactical sense, we are looking to degrade that business model as well as raise uh, international objection to the use of these tools in this uh, uh, somewhat novel manner. Uh, um, Wagner Group has developed a reputation for, for brutality, uh, including against its own members, um, but it has committed human rights abuses uh, in very uh, many countries where it's operated. An example, um, the UN uh, released a report in uh, May, 20, May this year um, a, about a massacre of 500 uh, civilians in Mali that uh, it noted was undertaken by Malian security forces and Wagner working together. And it documented uh, various crimes, including uh, summary executions, rapes, and torture all of which they, they uh, asserted amount to war crimes. So it's clear they're an un, uh, a destabilizing, unreliable and ineffective security partner who exacerbate conflict and instability wherever they operate and they hurt those they are supposed to protect, um, including uh, Russia, it's worth noting, with the, the rebellion, with very little accountability and that's one of the key drivers for today, I hope. Uh, We've all seen the, the rebellion uh, in June and then the subsequent demise of the Wagner leadership. And uh, those events are still playing out, but it's worth noting where we think uh, from a UK perspective, uh, the group is turning to. And more importantly, from, from my perspective and the work I do, other actors that are entering the field in this space. Uh, so there's been an, an incredible period of instability for Wagner uh, through the loss of its leadership. Uh, we, we'd assert that it remains a threat where it's operating. Um, despite the challenges of Prigozhin, uh, we would also assert and assess that the Russian government is keen to continue using private military security companies as proxies to achieve its foreign policy objectives. So this isn't a problem that is going to disappear with uh, the fall of Wagner if they do disappear. Um, Wagner has helped Russia achieve foreign policy objectives and we don't think they'll let that go lightly. Uh, as I said, we can see other actors emerging in this space, uh, notably uh, companies like Redut uh, or elements of uh, the Russian system like Ryush. Um, but there are also the potential for Russian military forces to take over from where Wagner were based as well. Um, the other aspect that's very recent that we've seen is that uh, Wagner has been subsumed or contracted to Rosgardia in Russia, which will enable it to reignite that logistic support that it had previously enjoyed prior to the rebellion uh, and may give it a, a further stretch of, of uh, impact in life. Um, it also seems to be headed up by Pavel Prigozhin now. Um, uh, whilst it's notable that thousands of members do appear to have left Wagner and gone to Redut and other places, they are still operating and will still continue to be a threat. Um, but uh, just touching on further evidence of Russia's intention to continue using this tool, um, it, it was noted that a former Wagner commander, uh, Andrei Troshev, met with Putin to set up a volunteer fighting uh, force uh, along with uh, the Russian Deputy Defense Mis Minister Yunus Bek Yukarov, who has also been seen touring African countries and offering Russian support. Uh, so it's very much still wrapped up with a state, whether it will be Wagner, Redut, or some other PMSC, or Russian troops. 
uh, we're keen that we, we work to stop that destabilizing influence. And so where do we come out of this? I think there's a couple of two key takeaways, some of which I've mentioned. Wagner is still a threat and we'll continue to can try and constrain and counter their efforts. Um, the second is that they're not the only PMSC, uh, for me, Russian one, but I'm sure there are other nations as well looking at that model and thinking about how they operate, particularly um, with reference to the way in which Wagner used disinformation or political interference uh, or self-funded through resource uh, exploitation. Uh, and so we're keen that that doesn't become a model to be used um, and that we continue to call that out in the international community, not to undermine the laws and norms and the multilateral systems um, that are currently in place. Uh, and I'll finish by uh, saying that I think for this group, um, uh, ways in which we can underscore what good PMSC activity looks like, what responsible um, private security and private military security companies do and how they operate, how they're accountable, and encouraging countries to sign up to the Montreux document or for organizations to join ICOCA, um, and ways and methods we can do that is, is of, of vital importance to us. Uh, and so I'm sure there's much more to say, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David, for um, giving us more detail indeed on, on, <coughs> on how uh, Wagner operates and, and the consequences of it. Um, next on my list is uh, Dr. Alessandro Arduino. Um, now, we, we, we've heard a lot about Wagner, but of course it's not the only context where um, different kind of PMCs might operate. So you are going to tell us a bit more about other contexts, in particular the China context. Yes, thank you. I think uh, Erica and David already covered everything that has to be said, so I will just try to repeat what they said and looking smart in doing it. Uh, <laughs> talking about uh, China, before that I will step back just a little and looking at Wagner and some issue. For example, the fact that uh, on uh, June 24th, Prigozhin, turned his back on his master and marched with an armed mutiny into Russia. That, in my opinion, was a defining moment, uh, not because what happened. It was a similar intention that arrived to a tipping point uh, between uh, Eugeny Prigozhin and the Russian general staff. But uh, what shocked me personally as a researcher, because I've been following Wagner since his inception in Syria and in Donbas, is the fact uh, that the word including Mr. Putin, was surprised. And this surprise came from the fact that we have been wrongly, for a long time, calling the Wagner Group a private military company. Private in Russia, company is not a registered company anywhere, with an exception of Wagner Belarus, just recently. And that's, there's a huge problem, because we have been framing our mindset mud in the water ourselves and put in Wagner with legal actor, with several private military companies that operated from Iraq to Afghanistan to other parts of the world and abide by code of conduct and are transparent and play by the rule. And this was done by Russia, not by chance, but by design. Why I'm going to say that? Because if you look at the evolution of the Wagner group, starting in Syria, at the time when Russia wanted the world to know that was back in Bashar al-Assad, but didn't want to be there with boots on the ground. There was even a case in the small battle of Deir al-Zur when US forces in three hours obliterated hundreds of pro-Assad fighters and 120 or 200 Wagner fighters, Russian soldiers being killed by US fire. World War III did not start because it was plausible deniability at its best. But then if we look at the shock that everyone had looking at the mercenary, at the proxy, at the paramilitary organization, not the PMC, fighting against his bankroller, his support. If we put this in a historical framework, looking at mercenary from the Middle Age to the Peace of Westphalia, having a mercenary reaching his zenith, he had only two options kill the king and becoming the king, or move away. And that was the option that Prigozhin had at the time. So if we use the mercenary historical framework in looking at Wagner, then it was no shock at all about what just happened. 
and what is going to happen in the future that is still. So basically, mercenary never disappear. They just flow behind the other header for quite a long time. And now, thanks in a negative way to Yugeni Prigozhin, all the spotlight are back on PMC, mercenary, and this discussion. But we really need, and that's important, the work that ICOCA is doing in redefining this label. Because if we got the wrong one, and we really get it wrong with Wagner, then we are going to have this kind of surprise that is not a surprise at all. Having said that, you can see, looking at Wagner from uh, Syria, it moved to Libya. And then in Libya, again, you have a typical example of Middle Age war with two different kind of mercenary, not private military, fighting from one side and the other. You have the GNA, who have its own mercenary. Then you have Khalif Haftar with his own mercenary. And then good luck to broker peace between the two parts, uh, but for mercenary, the only business model is preserving instability, is preserving chaos. And that's what Wagner did and is still been doing. Then you move from Libya and you move to Africa, Sub-Saharan Sahel, Kar, Mali, and all the other coup belt. When what Wagner is doing is preserving as Praetorian the military junta who are at the top of power and absorbing local very necessary resources, having diamond, gold, minerals uh, that has been extracted and then has been acquired by Wagner or even paid by hard currency. There is a contract allegedly with Mali that it count 10 million US dollar per month in training. Limited resources that could be used for peace building. And then if we move to your question, are copycat of this model, as, as David mentioned, yes. There are several countries that are looking at the Wagner model, but then again, if we use the wrong label, there is a lot of discussion of Chinese private security protecting the Belt and Road Initiative. In this respect, in mainland China, there are, depends on how you count, 7,000 to 10,000 private security company. Let me say, private security is not private military, <laughs> it's not mercenary. But then if you look at the one operating abroad, 15, 20, at very top level, most of them are unarmed. They are security manager, some of them are armed, protecting vessel, and protecting Chinese worker and Chinese infrastructure. So if we keep calling them mercenary or PMC, but with regard more to Wagner, that's an issue. Of course, what is the challenge, especially for researchers looking at the Chinese side, and is one that is also applying some way to Russia, how you define private in country that are not a proper market economy, and especially where the state end and the private start. But having said that, uh, you can see, uh, especially now at the geopolitical level, one thing that resonated very well in what David said, Wagner Group is first and foremost an umbrella term. There is different Wagner. Wagner in Syria is not Wagner in Mali, and especially not Wagner in Bakhmut in Ukraine. Even the age group of the fighter different. In Ukraine, is around 20 years old, while in Africa, is 35, even 40 years old, meaning they are veteran and mostly come from the Russia, GRU, and Special Forces. So that's why proxy and paramilitary fit a way better than when we are talking uh, about PMC. Having said that, back to China, you can see now, geopolitical level, there is this no-limit friendship between President Xi and President Putin. But then if you look at boots on the ground, the Belt and Road Initiative needs stability to prosper. The Chinese model is a development model, investment for sustainability. If we move to Africa, the Russian model is chaos, preserving chaos. And then again, apologies if I go back again to the Middle Ages and this thing, but just look at Machiavelli. He was used to say, the only thing that mercenaries are doing is preserving chaos. If they win, they are out of job. If they lose the battle, they're out of job. So they have to keep uncertainty going on. And this is the Wagner model. That's the Wagner effect, that chaos, preserving chaos. China doesn't need that. And an example is very straightforward. If you look at a car near Bangui, just a few months ago, nine Chinese miners were killed in cold blood. Investigation is still open. There is the discussion who did that. There are some finger pointing at Wagner. It's not conclusive. It was Caucasian 
soldier, mercenary, whatever you want to call, who killed these nine miner. Of course, the modus operandi was quite strange. Violence against Chinese miner is quite common in Africa, even before the Belt and Road Initiative, but is kidnapping for ransom, stealing gold, or stealing machinery that are very expensive. This one was a cold blood murder of nine Chinese miners. And after that, just two weeks after, there was a photo op with Wagner Group saving Chinese miners in the jungle. So now there is this problem at geopolitical level of Russian China alignment, but in Africa, for example, you can see how nimble mercenary organizations that are more free from the control from the top are moving against this kind of new actor. So having said that, uh, uh, definition is essential. It's a great work that ICOCA is doing, and I hope that this work in looking at real PMC against proxy, against paramilitary, and especially against mercenary will make the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Indeed, it, it is very relevant, and it, it is also a challenge from the legal point of view, uh, as you say, because at the legal level, at least, there, there are differences on terms, whether it's a PMC or a mercenary or armed non-state actors, all those are a bit fuzzy uh, at the legal level how to determine. But at the practical and policy level, it is very important to distinguish this. Uh, so thank you very much for, for flagging uh, that important, um, uh, the importance of, of using proper uh, terminology when we talk about Wagner as a, as, a, um, as a PMC or rather as a mercenary. And indeed, this will lead us to our last uh, intervention of today. Um, Drawing back and falling back on what you just said, um, Jamie uh, Williamson, you are the ICOCA's executive director, and indeed you will um, tell us what is the difference between legitimate actors or illegitimate actors, um, what, which actors could be uh, legitimately part of ICOCA, which could not be. Uh, that could be an interesting uh, question to ask you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, and I was. As you're all speaking about the Wagner Group, I was watching the faces of the security providers in the room and slowly uh, sinking <laughs> in your chairs. And I, I thought it was quite nice, actually, I have a red chair because in many ways, I'm that flip side of the equation in terms of the Wagner effect and what next for responsible security. So think of it this way, that's Wagner, this is responsible security. All right, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, looks like a duck, must be a duck. And I think that's the problem that the Wagner Group you know, all still caveats with the label, et cetera, has caused responsible security. It's been great to have the Wagner Group in the sense that it's created a new debate. It's allowed for space for reflection on what needs to be done to separate the so-called malign actors from legitimate actors. It's been awful at the same time because what we have seen over the past few years is a complete confusion as to what we're speaking about. Leave aside the elements linked to the Wagner Group and whether it's a group, whether it's a company, how they operate, whether they're mercenaries and the likes, that's one set of issues. I think the bigger set of issues have been for the so-called legitimate security providers out there. And the question that they've been asking themselves is, well, how do we separate ourselves from the so-called Wagner-type entities? How do we step up in a more proactive manner rather than on a back foot to demonstrate that actually the activities that we're carrying out for the most part, are legitimate, legal, and there's no issues with them. But there will be context and situations where you do get close to military-type activities, where there will be some question marks. And what we've seen over the past few years, and similarly to what we had in the days with uh, Blackwater and Iraq uh, 10, 15 years ago, was the same kind of positioning by the so-called responsible security industry. It was back foot and defensive, always trying to say, we're not them. And then questions being asked as to, so what are you? And quite often, when you try to explain what you are, most eyes blank over. People don't want to hear it. You're not exciting as an industry. It's as simple as that. Some of you think they are exciting, but the private security industry, for most people, is not exciting. And only becomes exciting when we speak about the Wagner Group. But you're tarred with the same brush. 
So you asked me about labels and frameworks and definitions. For those of, know, of you who know me, uh, both personally and professionally, you'll know that wherever I go, I get frustrated when I hear the acronym PMSC. Simple as that. It's an acronym which comes out of the Montour process. It's an acronym which is used every day, interchangeably, to describe any sets of actors. And that, I think, is where much of the problem starts in terms of definitions. It's a wrong use of an acronym to describe each and every one out there that's deemed a security provider. And we hear presentations. I actually put out a tweet in my moments of emotion, which are rare, uh, on Twitter in response to a program that I saw in Al Jazeera where we had so-called experts, including people that we work with, who were speaking about the Wagner Group. And then there was the labeling of PMSCs and or mercenaries. And the chat from Al Jazeera simply said, well, you know, I know there's differences, but it's simply to call them all that. So it's quite, it was a laziness in many ways. We just call them all PMSCs, even though there's a difference. So going back to what the panel is about, you know, how do we distinguish between the so-called Wagner type entities and the rest? What is the effect? that we're looking at, how do we have responsible security be seen for what it is? Well, there's many ways that we can go down and many sort of routes that we can look at. And it's at all levels, in my mind. Taking four or five in the time that I have, at the international level. International legal discussions about PMSCs are pretty poor today, pretty poor. And they're confused. It's as simple as that. Uh, there are different interests at play. There are legacy issues at stake. There are understandings out there in terms that states may have and experts have, which are based on legacy kind of conversations and are not necessarily sufficiently granular or nuanced today to make that difference in terms of where international legal frameworks go. There are processes within the United Nations which are good and potentially are deserving of more attention, but at the same time, there are contributions in those processes which every single time there's a session confuses the debate yet again. So at the international level, it's worth potentially revisiting the Montour document to determine whether or not those acronyms and the way the Montour document has been structured make sense in terms of reflecting the current state of the security industry and the military contractors out there. It may be that the Montour document is just fine, and it's more of how we implement that and how we look at the best practices. But clearly, there's a reflection to be had. And I would recommend strike PMSC as the label uh, in that document. At the national level, Regulators don't mix apples and pears. They don't look at the Wagner Group. They don't look at military contractors in the same way as the security industry. The legitimate security industry is regulated totally differently to companies like the Wagner Group. They operate on the territory of countries. They have to have licenses. They've got to be vetted. They have to be trained. They need to meet ISOs. And I'm looking at certification bodies here. Your business. Most people are bored when you talk about international work, ISOs, standards, quality management systems, oh, what's that? But that's what security companies have to go through. It's a business. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not exciting. Sorry, Tony, I know you do get excited, <laughs> but it's not exciting. <laughs> yeah? It is about audits, and you'll find the same kind of audits in any kind of enterprise out there, security or otherwise. That's what responsible security looks at, about being audited, acting like a business. There's a responsibility for the security providers themselves when they go to armed conflict environments. If they know that there's a risk of them being labeled military contractors and or mercenaries, then in my mind, security providers have to understand what legal frameworks are they operating under. They need to understand if they get a contract from a government to operate in a country which is a high risk environment or an armed conflict situation, they need to understand that there are certain types of activities which in the contract and on paper look pretty good, pretty legitimate, and you'll get some cash out of it, but actually you're getting closer, and I'm looking at some ICRC folk in the room, to direct participation in hostilities. You're getting closer to being so-called combatants in an armed conflict situation. You're getting closer to doing the kinds of activities that potentially could be blurred with the activities that the Wagner Group have been carrying out in those locations. Many security providers don't have that nuanced understanding. And many clients will quite often delegate that responsibility down to the security provider. And if something goes wrong, say, hey, we didn't tell you to fight. You sort it out. So there's the, I think, responsibility on the part of the security providers as well 
to understand that they have responsibilities on the international when they go into those contexts, and to understand at what point do they cross that threshold, and at what point will they be tarred legitimately with the same brush as military contractors, wagglers, and others. Laziness, complacency, lack of granularity, especially amongst sort of regulators and those debating these issues. There's an absence of nuance, there's an absence of understanding as to the details quite often in terms of what we're speaking about. And we need to overcome that. I think this panel, for instance, these kinds of forums, these debates going forward, need to push the reflection further, building on my earlier points. Why? Because if we simply go towards what is easy, if we simply label things mercenaries, go to PMC labels, think everything's military contractors, go negative on anything which is security, we won't find solutions in terms of, as you mentioned, Alexander, strengthening regulation, allowing so-called responsible security to step up and being seen as responsible and being held accountable appropriately, accordingly so, and dealing with the malign actors that you referred to, David, earlier. That complacency, we need to do away with. Why? As Alexandra mentioned, and you went down history, but you went future as well, which is the security industry is here to stay. It's not gonna disappear overnight. It's a huge, major employer, and we spoke about this earlier this week. It doesn't matter where you go in the world, be it here in Geneva, in Ukraine, in Libya, in Peru, you will find private security, and it's not disappearing. So, boom, that's a statement of fact. Work with that. But we are gonna see evolution of that security industry, and we're gonna see technology impacting the security. Military contracting, if we want to use that terminology, again, I don't think it's totally correct uh, either, or mercenism, it's not gonna go away either. That's gonna change and morph as we go forward over the next few years and over the next few decades. As you mentioned as well, Erica, in terms of what you know, militaries are downsizing, relying on more private actors. So if they're not going away, we need to have a better understanding uh, in terms of their responsibilities and what that's gonna look like as well. And we have to, create that differentiation and distinction, but we have to also recognize there will be a gray zone. And in my mind, the solid, legitimate security industry out there, that's easy to deal with. The mercenaries, the bad guys on that side, it's easy to deal with. It's that gray area in those kind of high-risk environments, not necessarily pure armed conflict, where people are talking about enhanced human rights due diligence, where you have conflict and conflict analysis. Those, that gray area where you may be stepping into one world or another, that are, is an area where I think more work is required going forward. Uh, and it's often in that gray area where we have a lack of transparency. As soon as something becomes conflictual, a conflict situation, most people step back in terms of being visible and transparent as to what's being done. And that's where I think the debates have to be had. Uh, because without that, level of trans uh, without that level of transparency, we won't be able to move forward in terms of dealing uh, with activities of responsible security providers uh, as distinct from activities of malign actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, so that sets the scene for uh, the Q&A and the discussions and all the questions that I'm sure you have for our panelists. Uh, we do have a um, good amount of time, which is good, uh, until about uh, 11 o'clock. Um, in asking your question, please introduce yourselves and uh, or if it's possible to ask precise question and not too many comments, just so that to allow um, for everyone to 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 chip in if if they want to. Um, so I'm guessing that yes, there is a mic coming in the room. Please, sir. Hello. Hi, thank you, panel. Um, my name is Mark Knight. Uh, I was a industry representative on the initial board of the ICOG uh, some while ago, uh, and I've been out of this context for a while, but I retain a focus professionally on security and human rights with all the security actors. So I just wanted to throw this into the uh, panel, and particularly the, the ICOCA, that it's strange that coming back after more than 10 years, we're still talking about PMSCs and the Montreux document and mercenaries um, because ICOCA at the time developed after the states had clarified how international humanitarian law 
impacted mercenaries and the difference with private security. Uh, the problem was the, the terminology of private military security companies, again, which the ICOCA um, went a great deal of, put a great deal of effort in with the industry and the other uh, partners in states and CSOs to make sure that that was not used again. So I'm surprised that it's still being used now. And I think I throw into the ICOCA itself and also the board here that the concept of mercenary, oh, the problem is with Wagner that in very quick summary, companies don't exist in international law, only states and individuals. So we have some trouble with this concept of a mercenary company. In IHL, an individual is a mercenary and it's a definition for a courtroom, not for targeting. So you're either, uh, you either have civilian protection or you're a, a legal combatant. That's, that's our problem. So part of the solution that I'm gonna chuck in is the terminology. We need something else to stop people <coughs> using private military security companies. And I'm gonna suggest you start using armed state proxy. These entities are armed state proxies. That's what they are. They're working for the state. They're armed and they're proxies. They're not companies. They're not focused on security. So in order to finally win this argument and clarify the terminology, it should be on the ICOCA to define a term and start using it because we can't just keep talking about mercenaries in shorthand and Wagner specifically. It's the final, it's the final nail to win. I think for the private security company. And once again, it's uh, armed state proxies. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, we will take a couple of questions. Uh, over there, the gentleman. <coughs> okay, thank you so much. I'm Caleb Wanga from Kenya. I remember several years ago, we were in this kind of discussion, but nothing much seems to have changed. I remember when we asked uh, about governments, legitimate governments using mercenaries to fight uh, opponents, either legal or illegitimate opponents. And uh, things seem not to be changing much. And uh, this is quite common in, uh, in African continent of late. I don't know how this can be shaped. Maybe Alessandro or the British uh, representative could give us some explanation on this because it's common. You remember it happened in Mozambique where my friend came from when the government invites a military, I don't know whether it's an illegitimate or a, or a legitimate group to support the government when they were, they were facing some serious threats. And it's true what Jami has said that it's difficult to continue clustering this in paramilitary and security companies because they are two different things. Okay, that's my... Thank you very much. Yes, please. Oh. Thank you. Hi, Gregory BT from IDG Security. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm probably drumming the point home a little bit as well, but um, I, I fundamentally agree with what's been said and thank you very much, Jamie, as well, for, for talking uh, about it in depth. I mean, I, I've actually been unlucky enough to, to see Wagner Group in the flesh three times in three different places, and they operate in a very different way to the company I now work for. And um, banding, uh, my company, UN is our primary client. Um, we, we only operate in very restricted environments. Every country we work in, we've got numerous legislative um, agendas and, and licensing and everything like this. And then you've got prescribed terrorist groups who are government-backed um, on the other side who are obviously doing uh, direct, gov um, direct military operations and in so many cases conducting war crimes. It's, it's wrong to ban all of that in the same way. And, and I agree with what was said earlier about um, calling Wagner a different name, but I also think it's really important potentially to talk about responsible security um, organizations in a different way as well, potentially something like security sector providers. And this is an issue that I think is also the case at the, the client level, um, be that with UN or governments or potentially with other private, um, private companies, commercial enterprises. Um, they often stipulate that they want 
PMCs. I mean, the US government does this, PMC or PMSC, and uh, but they're asking for a very specific security um, provision. So I think more needs to be done as well on, on the other side, calling private security providers who are responsible, who are members of ICOCA, and, and performing at a much higher level um, and, and to a higher standard of quality uh, to also potentially be called something different. I think, I mean, looking at the humanitarian sector and, and those who are probably in the room today, there is capability to actually go and do that sort of actor mapping, to actually go to that level, to do the research, to actually identify who is who and what is what. And Jamie, you're absolutely right. There are definitely grey zones. In some cases, security sector reform is a grey zone, uh, going and providing capability and capacity development uh, to, to a state actor or something. Th those are absolutely grey zones, but in the majority of cases, um, I think you could probably delineate, and I think it needs to be done, and I think this is probably a great place to start there. Thank you very much. So let's, we will take a first round of answers to these three questions and then I'll open again for, for the rest. So who would like to, uh, uh, to start responding or trying to respond to these questions? Yes. Okay. I will just summarize. First one, great point uh, in terms of talking about armed proxy. Issue, in my personal point of view, I'm not a legal expert, is the definition of mercenary. As you rightly point out, is on individual. But if you look at the boot on the ground, uh, mercenaries are not hired as individuals. They are hired in bulk now. So we need to reform that kind. Because if we look uh, at the kind of proxy, again, state armed proxy, look uh, at Iraq. You have popular mobilization unit, uh, over 70, armed, uh, but the driver is not the coin. There is still an ideology behind. And there are several other from the Middle East especially that are labeled as proxy militia. But then uh, the biggest issue is going again, what's the difference with mercenary? Moving back to, to Caleb, great question. Uh, Mozambique, in my personal opinion, is a great example. Because what we didn't mention much before, one of the set of the Wagner group uh, is that Prigozhin, who is the bank, was the bank roller not the founder of Wagner, it was Dmitry Utkin, an other operator from Russian GRU, is the fact that put together boots on the ground with propaganda, disinformation and misinformation that is spreading all over the African continent, and two key points of this propaganda. First, the West want to keep Africa weak, especially in Francophone Africa, it percolated pretty well, and you can see with what happened with Barkhane operation, with the French being kicking out of Mali unceremoniously. Having said that, the second part of this process is showing Wagner as efficient counter-terrorism operation. And that's where the question from Caleb is right on the spot. Wagner tried a counter-terrorism operation in Mozambique, in Capo Delgado. It failed utterly. Then there was other group, the advisory group from South Africa, who was called in. And now is a state foreign army that is providing security. So the narrative as uh, this force uh, being a benign actor, being a counter-terrorist force uh, is on the propaganda side. And it's something that we really have to look at. And uh, the example from the gentleman here with really boots on the ground example, uh, is something that we need to talk more, to have it more published, to see when there are the rightful actor that abide by law, that operated by conduct, when they face this group, what are going to be the, the consequences? And then definitely is something that needs more attention and we need to work more on this. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, thanks, Mark. Good to see you again. Haven't changed a bit. Um, armed state proxies, I think, is great. Um, I also think that um, you have to realize that actually many of these actors also operate for non-state actors too, and non-state entities. So there will be that kind of nuance to be looked at going forward. Uh, it's good that you mentioned the United Nations, and it goes back to that gray zone uh, area that I'm considering. DPKO is under a huge amount of pressure right now. We're seeing peacekeeping operations close down left, right, center. And there is a reflection right now in terms of the agenda for peace. What is the role for peacekeeping going forward? And are we going to see these kind of heavy peacekeeping operations in different parts of the world, despite the fact that the UN Charter does speak about a force for the United Nations? And this, I think, is where the gray zone is opening up again in terms of consideration of the inability of the United Nations to step into context and to use peacekeepers may give way to space for more 
private and state proxies, non-state uh, proxies as we want to label them, stepping in instead. And we've seen that debate starting all over again. Uh, we had it many, many years ago with Sierra Leone, executive outcomes, etc. but it's happening again because of the weakness of the DPKO setup and the weakness of the multilateral systems. So that international knock-on is going to have, I think, a PMC uh, knock-on effect in a sense that we may see a growing business as a result. And so that's, I think, where the international reactions have to be critical in terms of how do regional organizations, I see the EU in the room as well, for instance, how do we step up on that one to make sure that whatever solution is provided in this high-risk environment, if we don't have peacekeepers available, is a solution that meets international standards and does not create further problems. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add on to what Jamie said, and the, the term that was proposed, I think, proxy state actors, was it proxy yeah, state actors? State proxies. Uh, state proxies. I mean, in the literature, I, I use the term PMCs to, because I'm a bit scared of Jamie and I know his views, <laughs> but also like to <laughs> completely separate one bit of what we're talking about, which is private, this is military for hire, and completely separate that from the, the legitimate huge body of work, which is m far more numerous than what we're talking about. But, I mean, just something to add on that proposition for a, a definition. I want to underscore what Jamie said on, we also need to factor in corporate interests here, that they're not just proxies of states, but proxies, we are seeing non-state actors, we're seeing corporations. I'm. I tried to find it in my notes, I can't, but I'm thinking back, I think it was the early 90s, Sierra Leone contracted, um, I, it could have been Sandline International to push back on one of the military hunters, but they were paid by, Sierra Leone didn't have the money to pay them, so they did a deal with one of the multilateral diamond companies, so it was the multilateral, multinational diamond company that paid Sandline to come in and do the job for Sierra Leone, so it's it's really it's great. Again, what you said, so good good attempt at a definition, but let's not leave out that this is getting very very messy. Like where state stops, corporate interest starts, and non-state actor interest starts, is all becoming incredibly blurred, and we'll probably continue to do so in the future. Thank you. Um, I echo that point actually in that you look at Wagner, uh, there were definitely commercial interests well uh, under Yevgeny Prigozhin as much as he would have been working in accordance with what Russia would, would like uh, probably within sort of a, a, a tram lines of this sort of stuff is okay and then it's a lot of personal entrepreneurial push uh, and so to um, I, I think there's a lot of questions that all essentially relate to reviewing the definitions. And from a, a sort of policy practitioner perspective, I agree it's absolutely vital, but there's also a stage where we, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, need to, to move forward and actually combating these things. And sometimes we, we must use terms that we know are faulty in some way and caveat appropriately. So I think it's also incumbent when we are using these terms, uh, as people have, to caveat them. We mean this when we say it in this context, which doesn't make things easier necessarily, but it is an important part. Um, is touching on on the premise of, of using mercenaries uh, uh, sort of uh, state actors using mercenaries and uh, legitimizing that etc I'm quite wary of commenting I'm I'm also not a legal expert um, uh, but I think that the Montrose document does give some good indicators on how you can use PMSCs within conflict or, or associated with that. Um, and I would uh, maybe a, a chat afterwards uh, with, with my colleagues in, in Foreign Office about our view on that would be more uh, effective in answering your question. I realise that's not incredibly helpful. On the armed state proxies point, I think there are other considerations, as mentioned, that make that quite a problematic term to use in this way as well. Um, particularly as you would, uh, there are armed state proxies that have no commercial interest whatsoever, um, essentially just terror groups uh, who are linked very closely to states and other things and all in between. And so you, you muddy the water in a different way with that term. Um, whether that's beneficial or not, I think would be up to, to discussion. Um, I would note there, there's a UN draft regulation on PMSEs, and that feels like possibly an apt time to rediscuss the, the correct terminology for this. Um, uh, and so we can relay that to our colleagues to, to, to run that through again. Um, and I would also, just the point on, on the links to disinformation, I think, uh, and the effectiveness of, of uh, 
uh, of companies in place of, of peacekeeping forces. We've seen in, in Mali with Manusma's withdrawal, Wagner has not uh, meaningfully improved the situation there. And so we need to be very wary about what is the spin on the ground that may look good or may be politically expedient for the individual in power and what the actual capabilities are when and how we can combat those narratives to ensure that forces like the UN are, are positively viewed in countries where they're acting and ensure they're effective. I'll stop there. So thank you very much for this. Now I see there are many other questions and there were some hands raised before. So, okay, so can you start first and then I'll go back there. Yeah. I have the mic. Oh, okay, so you start, <laughs> yes. He was first. So. Oh, you were first, sorry. First. <laughs> right, Elias Siddiqui from uh, Whispering Bell. Um, my team has covered uh, Wagner in Libya. Um, we went through, from an intelligence standpoint, we went through the combat operations uh, in 2020, uh, 2019, and we've seen how they operate. So my question is addressed to all of you. Besides sanctions, what other proactive measures do you think governments can take to combat Wagner? In Libya, for example, we've seen it operate as a network. Sanctions have not been effective in tackling that network. Um, the local footprint is often missed out. Um, we've seen Wagner, for example, use Syrians um, to that speak Russian to actually have that sort of connection with local communities. We've seen them. We've seen locals take pictures of them when they went to supermarkets to go for their shopping trips. But that sort of presence has evolved into something more low-key, low-profile across bases, um, and they're within two hours of any oil field and capable of shut, shutting down the, the, the exports, the oil exports. Um, so we've seen that sort of network. So how do you deny that network um, the capacity to operate, and how do you demystify it? Um, I think it's very critical to, to kind of, besides sanctions, because sanctions have had zero impact on Wagner, in, in Libya at least. Um, you know, a couple of assets that they stopped using were put on, 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 on some list, on a designated list. Um, ag arguably the most sort of, you know, impactful, uh, you know, uh, move that we've seen was when a U.S. official took to Twitter to uh, directly accuse the LNA commander, Khalif Haftar, of having direct ties to Wagner and to ensure, you know, asking uh, Haftar to, to ensure that he does not sort of uh, allow Haftar to uh, allow the, the Wagner group to expand its footprint, um, especially given the fact that, you know, there's a conflict brewing in Sudan, uh, in Niger, etc., etc. So how do you, besides sanctions, what do you do to kind of tackle that issue? And going back, and also the, the second point is going back to, to definitions and, and labels and, and, and whatnot, I think it's very important to also focus on the media because the media has a role to play and, and, you know, I think about 70% of articles that we've all read mentioning Wagner at some point in the end of the article, you know, the shadowy world of security companies. Um, so, as, you know, how, how do you sort of tackle that as well? I think cause it's an essential point as well to, to, to combat that, that PMC presence or armed state uh, proxy presence. Thank you. Second question, please. Greetings, uh, I am Abdumani. I am from the Geneva Academy. I want to know um, how PMCs could contribute to uh, transitional justice processes, especially for countries that undergo transition, and where there are irresponsible actions by PMCs, uh, what are the if implications of ensuring that transitional justice processes uh, prevail? Thank you for the precise question. Thank you. My name is Chiwinke from African Law Fund, the Foundation of Free Law based in Nigeria. I'm actually thinking how, you know, the, looking at the growing influence of uh, uh, Wagner effect in Africa, and I think, you know, the, the implication in, uh, you know, strengthening the private security governance in, the, in Africa as a continent, because um, I think there is a weak and poor security sector governance in Africa that have uh, affected this. It means that we have to also look at uh, how do we strengthen uh, um, security sector governance and reform generally, and especially specifically looking at um, private security industry and uh, looking at their 
governance, the regular framework, and the need to have uh, 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 programs and policies that can improve uh, good international practices for responsible private good services. So um, I want to ask, what, what's your advice and uh, what's your thoughts in this regard? Because um, we need to have good examples for Africa. So we need to say, okay, for this sector, for industry, private industry, go to this country, see how good they are, see the examples that give, uh, the services they are providing, the industry, and all that. So which means uh, there's need to look at uh, in-country private security industry practices and their level of uh, private security governance. And it's because if we cannot have good examples, the countries where Wagner and his fate has ravaged become being highlighted. So we need to have examples we can highlight. Our civil society, if we go back and start talking, designing programs to try to push for this, the questions will always come of what of this, um, uh, especially the Sahel region where a lot of issues are coming up. So the, the, the need to have example, the need to push forward private security governance reform become very imperative. So I want to have know of your, your advice and ideas in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I will take one last question before turning to the panelists. I would, yes, please, one question from a female colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Fiona. I work for Kumi Consulting, and we're in the business of responsible sourcing. And we work a lot in the extractive sector. And what I would like to pick up is something that, Erica, I think you mentioned it slightly, with um, multinationals and the interests of multinationals. So I guess I have two questions. The first one will be, like, from the private sector, and I guess what will be the clients of the security providers? Do you think there's enough awareness about all the topics that we've just talked about with the distinctions and the definitions? So the first question, is there enough awareness? And the second question would be, what would you like to see from multinationals, um, especially companies that work in the extractive sectors? I think I'm thinking of mining companies. Um, they often work in um, conflict-affected and high-risk areas. So what would you like to see from, from them in this discussion? Thank you. Shall I? Uh, um, I can uh, look to provide an answer on some of those. Um, so I, I think on the first one, on the, on the value of sanctions and what else can be done to sort of inhibit Wagner in in, in very uh, complex uh, situations. I, I think the first thing to say is there's no silver bullet. Uh, it, there is a lot of uh, hard graft that needs to be done in order to to uh, reduce the operating environment for organisations like Wagner. Um, and in some places that will be easier to achieve uh, than others. Um, I would say that, that sanctions have uh, secondary effects. Uh, so it may not necessarily inhibit the action on the ground immediately, but they do tend to raise the costs to organizations. Um, they send an important message about how the, this activity is uh, unacceptable in the international community. And so whilst uh, you know, there is always a debate about how effective sanctions are on the ground, and I used to work on sanctions, so I'm very familiar with that, there are, there are secondary and tertiary benefits to, to using them beyond the deterrent effect on the individual. There are deterrent effects in the wider international enabling community. And we, have, we do see people not wanting to work with front companies that they are informed about and, and stepping up their due diligence and doing things like that. So it's not perfect, but it is one tool of, of, of several that we would look to use. I think you mentioned media, although in a, a different way, media is important and, and working with, with governments as well to expose malign activity uh, to the populations where it is happening, but also to the wider regional communities, finding regional voices that can, can speak to those from uh, a perspective that may be more informed than, than say, the UK's in that region. Um, I'd say the UK's also got a tool like prescription. The EU has a CT designation. It, it's similar effect to sanctions, but it is a different uh, angle, uh, and it, it implies a different um, 
issue and uh, and so there are wider tools like that i think one of the key things that we can do is not quick necessarily but it is raising capability working with partners understanding their needs and tailoring them the countries that you mentioned are obviously quite difficult to do that in at this point um, but that's certainly part of our wider package in other countries uh, in terms of uh, trying to draw states away from using organizations like Wagner, looking at how they can improve stability, avoid conflict, um, uh, educating the populations about the, the risks and the pitfalls of the disinformation, for instance. So there are things we can do, but it's not necessarily an easy or short journey. And I completely understand that there may be frustrations about uh, what appears to be a, a lack of, of attention or, or, or action on certain issues. Um, we can, you know, sanctions also can stop people from traveling to and for countries where they're going through other states. Um, but it also has an impact. Uh, there are international government discussions we can have and do have on things like illicit financial flows to try and close those down. That may not always be public activity, but it can help and it has helped. Um, so I, I take that point, uh, but I would say it's not a simple one solution. Sanctions are a useful part of that um, and we'll continue to, to work hard. And we appreciate any suggestions anyone might have on, uh, on other ways we can uh, constrain and deny uh, Wagner and others uh, of that ilk. Um, I think the other one I could quickly uh, comment on uh, would be uh, good examples. I think that's a, another uh, question about in ensuring local voices are heard. Uh, and the UK is keen to work with our partners in, in Africa, for instance, training local security forces in order to do uh, the jobs that, that Wagner might do or to point uh, other countries towards uh, other regional leaders and suggest that they might have a good view on this. So uh, nothing detailed I can tell you right now without looking into it, but it's certainly one pillar of the activity that we're doing. Um, and then on uh, the responsible, uh, on the mineral extraction piece, um, just a, a generic one from me in that when the, the UK uh, seeks to um, engage private security companies, the contracts will uh, hopefully, uh, ensure that the relevant standards are part of that, that they are ICOCA members or that they're adhering to the relevant ISOs. So I think there could be an element of raising awareness with contracting companies that they should have these in their contracts, which then should have a, a, a flow through effect uh, and obviously increase the business for all of you that are signed up, hopefully. Um, I don't know if anybody... Is I will briefly look uh, at the question from, uh, from Libya. That's a great question. I mean, say that again, uh, sanctions are a necessary starting point. Just relying on sanction is not going to help. We just don't have to look at Libya, look just at the US and Iran. It's a story that goes on for since 1979. Having said that, why Libya is important? Because on one side, you mentioned Wagner defending oil field, so preserving instability in some respect, and employing Syrian. On the other side, the wall, you have other mercenaries that also employ in Syria. So you have huge IHL abuse because these are people that have been shanghai into working as a mercenary, not even as a choice. Having said that, for Wagner, uh, is one of the most difficult operational area in the MENA region, which was this, the highest attrition rate. When I was working uh, on, uh, on my book, Money for Mayhem, I just looked at a specific manual that the Wagner Group was using in Syria, the use of drone, there was very limited footprint about uh, media interference because it's just the top of the spear in the kinetic action, and that's in Libya. But again, story with mercenary in Libya is not start with Wagner or with other operator on the other side. If you just look at the time of Muammar Gaddafi, sniper coming from Serbia. And then uh, beside this, uh, uh, what you mentioned uh, is a very great point, is the network. If you look uh, at the Wagner network uh, from Syria moving to Libya, and you look at that, you see other group fighting in the area, and these are group are RSF, the one that ignited the civil war in Sudan. And they are linked to Wagner. Wagner have diamond concession in Darfur, and at the same time, considering that RSF is fighting against an army, Wagner provided the manpad missile to shut down airplane and to equate the caliber. So you see this network that it moved in the MENA region and it percolated to the area, that's the real danger. So what to do? I'm not so naive uh, to say that just we need to frame uh, a very good loan mercenarism and we can stop it. In the Middle Age, again, sorry if uh, ad nauseum I might quote history, but mercenaries were compared to the Black Plague. 
but at the same time, everyone was using them. So I'm not seeing that disappear. We have just to, as mentioned by Jamie, narrow down as much as possible the gray area. Um, just a, a few points on solutions. Uh, I'm not sure how much um, helpful um, points I can make. I, I think a huge one I is around the dearth of data that we're, and again, just talking about this very narrow group of, of militant um, PMCs, uh, to the extent that we don't have a lot of transparency, a lot of data, it's really hard to craft solutions to stuff that we don't know about. Um, the second thing I would say is understanding that this uh, is as much an economic phenomenon as it is a, a, a militancy phenomenon. Even shadow markets have rules. But, and again, unless we can understand those rules and respond to them, uh, we can't craft effective solutions. Um, on the extractive sectors, um, I mean, of course, what we want to see is responsible legal conduct in compliance with international law and international humanitarian law. Um, I think where it gets tricky is when extractive companies enter into that grey zone uh, in their relationship with states. What is a threat to them blends with what is uh, a threat to a state and their interests become messy and aligned. So I think it's very important for, for Māori nationals to understand how they can often unwittingly be fueling um, conflicts that they, they may or may not know about. So be, to become more, much more active, engaged, informed players about the environments, the conflict environments, the fragile, fragile environments that they're working in and how what they do or don't do can fuel those conflict dy dynamics it is incredibly important. Thank you, Jamie. Oh. You'll have the last word, oh, actually. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there were a couple of points which weren't touched upon in the answers, but I think... Um, on the Libya one, I'm not going to come across anywhere as intelligent as Alessandro on this one, um, but I'm going to be naive in my offering. And it's been naive uh, building on your last point, Eric, as well, about the market drivers. And given that last night after an AGA, I had to sit down with my daughter and do her economics uh, homework with her. And it was the basics, demand, supply. And then dealing with the environment, looking at merit goods and demerit goods. And then determining how do you strangle that demand uh, and the reliance on individuals, on corporations and others, that reliance on those so-called malign actors. And that, in my mind, builds on what Chinuike's point was, is how do you create the environment which will no longer need the such actors and which make it impossible for such actors to operate, whether it's through good governance, economic reform, rule of law, etc. All the stuff that's been spoken about for years and decades in many contexts in which the UN and other entities and states here speak and preach about, but also implement locally. And I think in many of these contexts where we do see a presence of the so-called malign actors, including the wider group, it's in exactly those contexts where there's fragility, where there's weak rule of law, where there's poor governance, where communities are being disenfranchised in many ways, where there's a rush towards conflict uh, type minerals, as they call them. And that, in my mind, is much more uh, sort of systemic in terms of an issue that has to be dealt with. It's economic, societal, governance, and it's bigger picture things. So sanctions, yes, uh, do work, but they don't necessarily deal with the core issues and the core environmental uh, uh, sort of characteristics which have allowed those actors to operate in the first place. So there has to be, I think, uh, going up to a higher level of sense of responsibility by states, international community, to address those fragile environments to prevent the environment allowing for such actors to operate. There was a very specific question on transitional justice. Um, thank you for giving it to me. Um, but I fully agree. I think transitional <coughs> justice as a mechanism, uh, and we've been talking here about corporate actors, we've been talking here about the, the military type actors, but we've not spoken much about the affected communities. And that's in many ways what transitional justice is about is to give a voice to the victims and to the survivors and to have some form of coming together and forgiveness in some locations or justice as the case may be uh, required for the affected local communities. It's easier said than done because it does require individuals to step up, to want to be heard, to want to be forgiven, to be truthful, and it also requires 